Confidentially, do you like this as well as singing? Leave your name with the girl when you go out. We Thank may you. get to you for some crowd noise. Sure and calm. <laughs> All right. A little studio chatter between Bing Crosby and Bob Hope during a recording session for the song Put It There, Pal, from the Hope and Crosby movie Road to Utopia, one of the most surreal comedies to ever come out of Hollywood. Bob Hope is the subject of a substantial new biography called Bob Hope, Entertainer of the Century. And that's not an overstatement. Bob Hope conquered Broadway, radio, film, and television, and was the creator of what we now call stand-up comedy. The author of this book, Bob Hope, Entertainer of the Century, is Richard Zoglin, who joins us right now. And Richard, why Bob Hope, and why now? Well, I had done a lot of writing about comedy and stand-up comedy, and and I always was interested in kind of who was the originator of stand-up comedy. I'd done a book on the comedians of the 70s uh, that courted George Carlin, Richard Pryor generation, and they were, of course, rebelling against the old-timers like, uh, like Hope. But I, right. I really kind of got to thinking about him, and I thought he was sort of the originator of sort of what we think of as modern stand-up comedy. And so I... I I was a big fan of him growing up, and I felt uh, also that his reputation had kind of been damaged during the Vietnam years and in the later years when he got old and kind of um, frail. And, and so I, I felt it was time to take a fresh look at him and sort of re- recognize all the ways he was a, a pioneer in show business. You know, like you, I grew up watching Bob Hope's movies, those uh, great films he made from the late 1930s into the early 1950s. Yeah. And to me, he was on par with uh, Laurel and Hardy and the Marx Brothers and Abbott and Costello, all the comedy greats. I was baffled when I got older and realized that others didn't hold him in the same high regard, which to me is like willful ignorance. You know, that's like uh, somebody who uh, watched his TV specials when Bob was in his 70s and 80s and and wrote off his entire career because Bob was on autopilot, you know, at that age. Right. I mean, he had so many different careers. Uh, His movie career, boy, back in the 40s, he was one of the biggest stars in America and and his and constant turning out constant hits and a lot of those movies are very good. They're not quite, they never had quite the cachet of the sort of Marx Brothers, Chaplin, the kind of greats, you know. Um, but he was great in them. And uh, I, I think that's why I grew up with those films, too. And I love those road pictures. Then on TV, um, even the early TV specials were pretty good. He when he was fresher. He wasn't depending so much on the cue cards. Then as the 60s and 70s went on and he started to, to get a little bit more, you're right, on autopilot, then I think they got to be fairly standard and routine. But, you know, you can be a pioneer only so long and an True. edgy kind of um, comedian only so long, and then you start to, um, to lose some of that uh, freshness. Sure. I mean, when you think about the Marx Brothers, there's a huge difference between Animal Crackers and then Love Happy. Sure. You know, you watch those movies. I, I think over time we've ro- sort of romanticized that it was all great. You know, like uh, Three Stooges meets Hercules is as good as, you know, a, a curly short from 1942. I right. mean, clearly that's not the case. But I knew even then watching those TV specials, which I enjoyed, you know, the ones from the 70s and 80s and 90s, uh, I, I knew even then that that was basically a victory lap, that the great work had already been done. Also, though, the, you know, the, the monologues, even as he got older, and I, the monologues were still good, and he, he was still sharp, and they weren't, you know, edgy political satire, but he certainly was covering the topical issues of the day. You can sort of kind of chronicle the, the eras by, by uh, you know, in the 50s, he was talking about the Cold War and Russia, and, and in the 60s, he was talking about Vietnam and the hippies, and in the 70s, he had new subjects. And he really was, you know, his monologues, you can really <laughs> chart American pop, you know, history and popular culture uh, through his monologues. So I think, you know, he was an important voice. And as you correctly point out in the book, Bob Hope invented stand-up comedy. Back when he started in radio in 1938, all the other big radio comedians who were, who were stars at the time were doing more kind of vaudeville kind of humor with characters. They play, you know, Benny playing the stingy character, uh, Bergen and McCarthy, you know, the ventriloquist and his right. dummy, Burns and Allen, who were doing very vaudeville kind of stuff. 
you know, Hope came in to radio, and he didn't have a character to play. He didn't have a, a kind of set routine. He told his writers, and, you know, he hired a lot of them, and said, give me jokes, read the papers, give me jokes out of the news, or, or what's happening in Hollywood, or, some, you know, or Hope's own life. And, and that was, you know, that was something new for radio. Other comedians were not doing that. This was brand new. The Pepsodent Show, starring Bob Hope. <laughs> When you're feeling lonesome, strictly on your lonesome, where there's life, remember there is still Bob Hope. Thank you so much. How do you do, ladies and gentlemen? This is Bob, middle of the winter hope, telling you if you've got preserves in the cellar, use Pepsodent and you'll preserve what's under your smeller. tired tonight. I went down to get my license plates yesterday. You know what a license plate is? That's the last thing that whizzes over your head when you try to get across Hollywood Boulevard. <laughs> well, here I am at the Camp Pendleton Marine Training Base. That's a polite way of saying, you may have been the apple of your mother's eye, but you're in the core now. <laughs> and these Marines were wonderful to me all evening. They were very friendly and unselfish. And then we met some girls. But they got me a girl that was really beautiful. She looks like she dropped right out of heaven and her parachute failed to open. <laughs> nice to be back, and the whole NBC staff turned out to welcome me back today. Everybody, everybody from the office boy down. And it was a wonderful reception. <laughs> I was a little disappointed with the trip back. I wanted to fly United, but the hostess had other ideas. <laughs> And everybody was excited because I was back When Gypsy Rose Lee heard about it She dropped everything <laughs> Imagine traveling faster than the speed of sound That means I can put a Crosby record on my phonograph And be out of town before he starts singing We're talking with Richard Zoglin, author of the book Bob Hope, Entertainer of the Century. You know, Richard, there are a lot of stories about Bob Hope and his comedy writers. Right. And, and you've got them in the book, and they were great comedy writers, the best in the business. But it's gotten so that Bob's detractors will point to them and say, well, he needed those guys because Bob Hope wasn't funny. Now, that's another example of what I would call willful ignorance, because Bob Hope was brilliant off the cuff, came up with incredibly funny lines. I have a recording from 1948 of a Martin and Lewis radio show, and there's a flub. Bob Hope is the guest. And you would think that Martin and Lewis, as the great improv comedians, would run circles around him. That is not the case. Bob Hope dominates with his ad-libs. Just a minute, Mr. Hope. There's just one thing I'd like to say to you. Perhaps I don't look as good as some others with a physique, but it's arbitrary to me to bird pissing for any one of those persons that shouldn't have to pissing. The cops are here. CBS don't know how lucky they are. What do you want from me? I didn't do nothing. as long as you. <laughs> I doubt if you'll make it. I'm trying. You're a sweet boy, that's all. You really think so? I do. <laughs> that's why I'm here. I'm not really after him. Say, uh... Yeah, he, he was. He was very good at uh, comebacks and, and, you know, when, when there were flubs on the air into the TV uh, era too. He was very good, and and I've heard some ad libs, you know, that you, it had to be spur of the moment. Now some of the ad libs, you know, uh, may have been scripted before right. you know, the quote unquote ad libs, but there were times when you you know you couldn't script things, and Bob was quick and always always uh, confident and you know fast on his feet and and just sort of knew how to roll with the punches. He was really good. In, in your book, you tell a story about uh, he had uh, Chico Marx on the program. Yeah. And there was some f flub, uh, and Chico was, you know, didn't respond, and there was uh, silence. And right. Bob says, uh, you know, what are you doing, Harpo? Oh, yeah. 
if you think you are, Harpo. <laughs> if he had dropped a script or something, yeah. he was fishing for it, and there was some silence. Yeah. <laughs> now that's a great ad lib. A great ad lib. You know what's interesting about that? Uh, his radio show, when you think about it, he comes out, he does a monologue to start the show, maybe about four or five minutes. They go to a guest, and then they have a skit, they have uh, music. That is the template, really, for all the late night talk shows. Yeah, you're right. That's that's the monologue, the guest, yeah. the, the sketch, the guest. Um, you know, others. There was a certain similarity. There was other radio shows had a kind of similar format, but no one was doing a monologue like Bob. Right. You know, and that was what distinguished him. You know, I I was talking about those comedians from the '70s, from you know Carlin through say Jerry Seinfeld, and when they they would sometimes reference the older guys. Um, Jack Benny or Groucho or something, but but they never mentioned Bob Hope. So that's that's one of the things that made me, gosh, this is unfair. This guy, Bob Hope, in, basically invented their art form. You have to just go back a generation to see how he was innovating back then. And if it hadn't been for, yes, we moved on from that and, and comedy changed, but if it hadn't been for Bob sort of setting the stage, the, the, these all these comedians today wouldn't have had an art form to, to sort of, um, you know, develop yeah well you you have one uh noted comedian and and filmmaker who uh was never ashamed to cite bob hope as an influence and that's woody allen yeah he uh always would say he bob hope was his biggest influence and and you can see oh yeah in the movies the uh, or woody's early movies particularly the characters he played the same kind of nervous wisecracking character that uh, that Bob Hope played and in the in um, some of the films with Diane Keaton he would always say you know Keaton was like was like Bing Crosby to his his, yeah. his Bob Hope stay away from us will you sister please I want to help you oh she wants to help us yeah, what's the matter you mad because we're still breathing can't we be friends I'm really very grateful grateful huh what's the idea of turning us in then I don't know what came over me I found myself saying things, and I didn't know why I was saying them. Look, why don't you just run for Congress and let us alone, huh? Oh, no, look, lay off those kisses. You know he's weak. Oh, I just wanted to show my gratitude. Well, show me. I can take it. All right. I'll get him in the next round. Oh, oh. <laughs> you should have been with me in that refrigerator. I, I have a very low threshold of death. Uh, my, my doctor says I can't have bullets enter my body at any time. And he gave you a good blurb for the book, too. <laughs> he did. <laughs> and he doesn't give blurbs. Yeah. Was... <laughs> but he, he, he really just read the book and, and liked it. I knew I had interviewed him for the book, and I also interviewed him for, for another s- story I was doing for Time magazine. And he, uh, he was very eager to see the book because he honestly, you know, did love Bob Hope, realized that Bob hadn't had a, a really good biography and needed one. And so he was really eager to see to read it, and uh, it was very nice of him. Yeah, uh, you know, you mentioned the comedians who would reference uh, other comedians, more edgy comedians, maybe your Mort Sauls and your mm-hmm. Lenny Bruce's. I've been involved in uh, various different radio productions that deal with young comedians, and I hate to tell you, uh, the young ones today, they don't know Lenny Bruce. Uh, and it's okay. interesting how that's changing. Yeah, I mean that's uh, I can see that. Yeah. Um, now their their influence is. Uh, be Mitch Hedberg is an influencer. Yeah. Bill Hicks. Right, Bill Hicks. Right, right. and these are guys that yeah. I think of them as recent. <laughs> sure, but uh, yeah, well, it's the fate of every innovator. I think to eventually his innovations seem old hat, and um, maybe Lenny. And in fact, when you listen to Lenny Bruce today, a lot of his stuff doesn't sound as funny as it, and as edgy as it did back then. But he was, when he was doing it, he was getting arrested for that stuff. So <laughs> right. you have to give him a lot of respect. That's true. Do you think that Bob Hope becoming a bona fide national treasure, I mean, with battleships and airports and yeah. all this stuff, that maybe people lost sight of him being a comedian as he, he just became almost a face on Mount Rushmore? Well, yeah, and, and you know, comedians think of themselves as rebels, and, and that's part of the thing. They're satirists, they're insurrectionists uh, to a certain degree, um, and, and Bob, you know, was the establishment. <laughs> Comedians yeah. like to be anti-establishment. He was the establishment. I think, but of course, that's what made him such a major 
entertainer. You can't think of another entertainer uh, who had such a role on the public stage. Uh, you know, friends with every president. Um, you know, in Vietnam, and and whether you agreed or disagreed with him, he was a force. Yeah. He was Nixon was bringing him into the White House to brief him on what was going on in Vietnam. Um, and you know, what other entertainer, uh, you know, can say that? And I, I I make the point in the book, and that that I think Bob. All the work he did for the troops, entertaining the troops, all the charity work, I really think he set the, the standard for public service in Hollywood. And so all the younger stars, the, the George Clooney's and, and Angelina Jolie's, who are activist sort of stars, I think that uh, Bob Hope kind of made it possible for that kind of, you know, for Hollywood stars to be taken seriously as, you know, public figures. Well, I hope your book goes uh, some way towards uh, reappraisal of uh, Bob Hope's career? Well, I think it has, and, and I know it had a great reaction. And uh, I was just at the Library of Congress uh, where I did lots of my research, and they were doing a weekend of Bob Hope movies. Oh, well, I, there you go. So I, I hope to see more of them. Yeah. Uh, I really think people, and people, when they see those old road pictures, I was introducing Road to Morocco and watching it again and in, a, in an audience. I mean, it gets laughs. People, I think, People are really surprised to see those films. They, they, those row pictures, particularly, I think they really hold up, and they al- they almost seem very modern because oh, yeah. of all the sort of breaking of the fourth wall they do, talking to the camera and that stuff. That seems very modern. So there's a uh, an author who has a podcast, uh, a young lady by the name of Karina Longworth, who did a uh, special on Bob Hope, and I, she actually put it well. She said uh, the road movies are almost like the missing link between the Marx Brothers and the Airplane films. Yeah. And that, you know, they're very meta. They're referencing things, yeah. you know, in the culture. Definitely, It's yeah. almost like the movie is uh, in the way of them having fun. Yeah, right. Well, they're, and they're, or it's, it's seamless. They're, they're, they're acting in a film, but, you know, they're stepping outside the film, and you're sort of very aware of them as personalities outside the film. So um, that's... That's what makes them so fun. So what are you working on next? Ah, well, it's, uh, I'm still kind of trying to come up with that. You know, <laughs> it's, the, the problem is that after B- Bob Hope, everything, everyone else seems like an anticlimax. You know, <laughs> I call him the most important entertainer of the century. So now what do I do? I, <laughs> uh, I have, everybody else seems a little bit lesser. But I may not do a biography. It may be uh, more of a topic, so... We'll see. Okay, so so maybe your next book will be the least important entertainers of the <laughs> <Right>. century. <laughs> Something like that. Thank you so much, Richard. Where can people uh, catch up with you uh, online? Is there a website? I have a website, richardzoglin.com. And uh, gosh, I'm kind of all over the place here and there. <laughs> but uh, yeah, on the, on the website you can find me. All right. Thank you so much. I appreciate it. Okay, thanks a lot.